this computer. Okay, there we go. All right. Well, hello. Um, thanks for joining us in week eight of the Make Guitar podcast. I think it's week eight. Um, it seems like week eight. I think uh, two weeks ago was week six. So um, I want to go with that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Vulcan pedal, among other things. Um, I guess as it comes up, um, it's going to be a free-flowing conversation. Yeah. Yeah, so how, how are you doing this week, Kirk? Oh, you know, I'm doing pretty well. Um, uh, it's my weekend now, and, you know, as it always is when we have these these discussions, but uh, um, I don't know. It's just, it's a time of, you know, just working for the weekend. I had that song by Lover Boy stuck in my head for the last <laughs> two days, and I feel like that's really like I've hit the stride with this blue collar, you know, warehouse work. Nice. And as long as we're talking about songs that get stuck in your head, for some reason, I woke up this morning and I had this song from, uh, you've heard of Rocky Horror Picture Show? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, there was a sequel to Rocky Horror called, um, shit, what was it called? Um, I think it was named after a city in Oregon. I'm trying, the name is escaping me now. Hmm. And that, well, anyway, and then they have a bunch of weird, it's like a musical, like Rocky Horror, but there's a song in it where the guy sings like he's, like he's, he's having love problems, but he's singing to all of the appliances and household items. So he sings, dear blender, won't you help a first offender? Oh, toaster, don't you put the burn on me? Yeah. <laughs> refrigerator you know and then he works his way into the bathroom and he sings the toothbrush <laughs> like you know, you know that's great you know it's like inspiration for songs nowadays doesn't seem like it really ventures outside of the usual you know like um meeting and and love um concerns enough you know we, we need we need more subject matter for you know for popular songs yeah, yeah. Well, that one, I don't know why it's stuck in my head, but the, for some reason I woke up this morning and I was thinking about that. I almost had to just go pull up the video and watch it just to get it out of my head. <laughs> I, I have a trick for getting music out of my head. Um, Flock of seagulls. Oh, well, that would, that might work. Um, but sometimes music can be really persistent. Um, so, um, so it's a trick and I'm not even sure I can you know, say it on, on uh, our stream without getting demonetized, but it's, uh, it's the theme song for the Menin deodorant. It's, it's three <laughs> notes and it, the song is over. In fact, actually, I think that the um, copyright law, you have to like do seven notes or something like that to infringe. So I'll just sing it by Menin. <laughs> and that's it like the song is over so like whatever you had stuck in your head before you start singing that is gone yeah i think i remember that actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah what happened to the jingle you know like nowadays they don't really have jingles you know they just get like a pop song and they buy the rights to it you know and then they turn it into like a tv commercial but in the past like they had people that wrote jingles you know Right. Yeah. And that was like a, an art form, you know, and it's lost. You know? <laughs> I know my, my boss was listening to uh, 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 Raymond Scott the other day. Oh yeah. I love and Raymond he Scott. Had so much, like there were some great jingles that were just super weird. Yeah. Um, and he would, you know, do the accompaniment for it. Yeah. There yeah. was one that like the, 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 uh, the voiceover was like, don't beat your wife every <laughs> night. <laughs> And it oh, must have God. Been for the detergent or something like that. They're like, so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> People are so terrible. Yeah. You know, that Raymond Scott guy, you know. he was kind of a genius. Like he invented all of these electronic instruments, like before synthesizers, like before you could go out and buy a yeah. commercially made electronic instrument, like Raymond Scott, like, you know, just made them himself. 
right? Yeah. And then he had all these instruments he had made. And so like he used them to create the sounds for advertising like and he kind of like talked about it as like he that like he had these sounds that no one else had they were like totally unique and like you know he was doing it in like the mm -hmm. 50s right um and back then like in the 50s everything was all about science and landing men on the moon and like you know like progress you know and stuff like that so like the electronic sounds that raymond scott were, was coming up with were like unique and like mm -hmm. in vogue right yeah um, and then also he never commercialized any of his electronic instruments right so so like like he never turned the instruments into a product because like to him it was like his secret sauce right so he was like right. i don't give this away i'm the only person with this and you, you know the funny thing is he hired a young robert moog to build some of the instruments so when moog mm. was in college Raymond Scott saw an ad like Moog was making these theremin kits and he would send them out like mail order right and so Raymond Scott ran in bought a or ran into Moog bought a theremin kit and then you know called up Rob and said hey hey Bob why don't you come over here and uh, and you know help me out with these projects right and so so Robert Moog said that essentially like like um, Raymond Scott had invented the sequencer right he pretty much invented it and he got moog to work on it right he's like yeah i want to make this thing that plays a sequence of notes and you can program the notes right you know and um moog said that he like it was kind of a gentleman's agreement like he wasn't gonna steal raymond scott's idea but then at some point like moog started building synthesizers and he was like you know if i didn't build a sequencer some other company was gonna do it mm -hmm. so at some point he kind of came out with it anyway right but uh but I always thought that was kind of an amazing story, you know, um, you know, because yeah, Raymond Scott was pretty interesting character, you know. Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, his collaborations with other people are, um, are are interesting as well. But you know, his the stuff that he did himself, um, I think, has that, you know, that that signature utopian future. You know, is there is idealistic. Uh, the Jetsons. That's yeah, what makes, yeah, very what much makes so. me think. Yeah. yeah, I used to have a have a CD that had all of his like, you know, little samples of all his commercial music. Like, you know, he'd do this like Alka Seltzer commercials and, you know, Excedrin, you know, and it was mm -hmm. like the sound of like a headache, you know, and they'd have right. a voiceover of a guy talking about, you know you know, how, how like, oh, you know, that pain, it won't go away, you know, and then it was like, you, woo, you know, like, and then like, it would kind of, ah, you know, it would move into kind of another sound that was kind of soothing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was really, he was really imaginative. Um, I think that made him perfect uh, for being a collaborator of the, the Muppets, you know, with Jim Henson, because I think he did some work with Jim Henson as well. Well, I never knew that. Fact, I, I think I just, the organized mind is uh it's uh oh. it's it that's jim henson and raymond scott okay i've heard that actually yeah yeah I, I forgot that that was that was jim henson yeah you know what you know the funny thing is like he um before the electronic stuff he had a quintet and they did a bunch of music that was just super kooky so raymond scott was like a band leader like i guess on the radio or something right hmm. so he was kind of like um like this band leader and um and then he did all this really super kooky music and weird time signatures and like really fast with lots of weird changes and stuff. And apparently like uh, um, Carl Stalling, I guess, was the guy at, at Warner Brothers. Like he bought the rights to the Raymond Scott music. So all that music you hear on Bugs Bunny and you know Roadrunner and all those Warner Brothers cartoons is the Raymond Scott music. Oh, wow, okay. Dun, 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 ba, dun, 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 dun. that's Raymond Scott right you know so like all those kooky like musical things like you know Carl Stalling saw it heard it and said like wow that I gotta put that in my cartoon so he bought the rights to it you know that's cool um, yeah it's super cool yeah I guess I guess too like like Raymond Scott kind of like you know he hired people to play in his band and you know you pretty much just played Raymond Scott's music the way he wrote it you know, and he kind of like also he was like one of those guys, one of those guys that mm -hmm. leads the band and is like, you know, he, he like I think at some point he said that he would rather work with machines because they would just do exactly what he told them to do. And I, maybe that's where he, I don't know if he said that before or after he started doing the electronic 
stuff, you know, but uh, maybe that's where he got his, his idea. You know, it was like, I'd rather work with machines, bing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like, I'll make some, you know. Yeah, I could see, I, um, I could see how that'd be controversial. Um, how would that go over in your band? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's like automation. Like if you, you know, you work in a, a shoe factory and they build a machine that does your job, um, it's kind of, you know, that's, that's the end. So you're going to hate that machine. You're going to become a Luddite and mistrust technology. Hmm. And I'm not saying that Luddism is bad, but, um, but yeah, when machines start to take human jobs, um, uh, yeah, we, we kind of revolt. Um, that's why I like machines like this because, you know, they work for us. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's the, um, the, uh, Chihuahua. Yes. This is the, the ch plutonium Chihuahua. Yeah. I have one of those. I think, I think it's actually a really good wah. Oh yeah. No, you introduced me to it. It's a, um, it's, it's my one and only my, you know, favorite wah I've ever played. Yeah. I like that one. Mm -hmm. I should get mine out. I haven't been using it lately. I've been using this, um, this uh, WA probe. Mm. This, is, this is actually a Vexter, which is the cheaper Zvex, like they're kind of cheap brand. And then they have like the, you know, made in America Zvex brand. Right. And the, actually the Vexter is better than the Zvex one. So maybe some of the pedals, that's not true. But for this one, I'd rather have this pedal because it actually has three knobs on it where the ZVEX one only has one knob. So this has like a sensitivity and a mix knob and a range, right? Where the other one just has the volume, I think. Is right? that an auto wah? Is that what it's what it's doing? Or does it have some kind of a treadle? Oh, you know what? It's got a um, kind of like a, I don't know what you call it, like a capacitive sensor or something. So as you just get closer to the plate, oh. it changes the wah. So you actually, it doesn't have any moving parts, right? So you just like, as you move closer or further away, it kind of detects like the, the distance between like your foot, you know? Um, so this, and cool. it works pretty good, actually. It sounds all right. The wah, like the chihuahua actually has like kind of more range of the wah sound. Like this, mm -hmm. the wah is actually kind of mild, but it does work pretty good. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, the, the good thing about that is it's not going to move away from you. Whereas we've discussed this in the past, <laughs> like when you push down on the, the chihuahua, it sort of moves forward. <laughs> Every time yeah. you push it, it just moves on the carpet. Yeah, it's, it's got that spring in it, which is pretty strong. Cause it always yeah. springs back up. Right. So it's got this like strong spring. So as you press, it wants to slide along the floor, you know? Yeah. I think I should see if the rubber feet for this are in the box. Cause that might, <laughs> that might stop it from moving on the carpet. I, I, I think you might need a little more. You might yeah. need some Velcro cause it's, it's actually, it's pretty, it slides pretty good. Mm. Um, otherwise it works, that, 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 that pedal works good. You know, the you cool, unique thing about that one is that you don't have to turn it on or off. You just step on it and it kind of detects that you're stepping on the pedal. And then all of a sudden it engages the wah. And if you, if you take your foot off of it, it'll disengage the wah. Yeah. I think the, the UX for it is, uh, it's really good. Uh, it just totally makes sense. Um, your heel isn't involved in any way except for just to balance you. Uh, I think using a regular Y is difficult. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, and that one's kind of reverse. So like normally, like you're getting the full Y sweep when you're going toe down, mm -hmm. or this one, like you go heel down and you're getting the sweep. It's kind of backwards, but it actually kind of, it feels right, you know, like it does, right. feels good. Yeah, I've seen other spring-loaded Y's um, that, um, that work the opposite way. So, um, so it, 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 the, the wow part of the, of the wah is when you push down. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that one works good. I'd recommend that to anybody, you know, well, I especially, if you're, especially if you're like new to the wah, <laughs> it's like easy to use that one. The, the traditional crybaby actually takes a little bit of practice to get the swing of it. Right. Yeah. yeah, the only other wah pedal I have is uh, it's integrated into my uh, my uh, 
Boss GT3, and um, the pedal on it is it's terrible. It's just like it, it's metal on metal. It just clunks on both sides. So I need to, you know, build some padding or something into it. Oh, so it kind of bottoms out. Like as you go through the, yeah. Oh, that's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, there's no kind of a spring or anything like that. So you, like if I'm playing in my apartment, I hear it, it, the, the smashing of the pedal <laughs> into the board over, you know, it, it's louder than the actual guitar coming out of my amp in my oh, that's apartment. That's terrible. Yeah. 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 We should do, we got to do a wah episode. I have a few wahs, you know, I actually don't even use them that much, but I have a, I have a bunch cause they're all kind of different, you know, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd actually recommend that, that um, wah probe to anybody too. It's pretty easy to use. You just step on the button on the top to start it. And then you just move your foot past the, the plate, you know, that's cool. I'd love to see a demo of it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that another time. So what are you what are you working on these days? What this week? What were you working on? Well, this week, um, actually, I wasn't working on it because I didn't have this stuff. But um, this morning, I did an unboxing video of a bunch of parts. Um, actually, three projects. Um, I've got the uh, the pickups uh, and the uh, the the wiring harness and uh, everything for my uh, set neck Telecaster project. Um, so I did a mock-up of that, um, and then I got the, uh, the quick plug, uh, you know, like the little apertures that you glue on, you know, you, you cut the cords on your pickups and convert them into quick plug. So I got those and I got the, um, the EQ and the piezo pickup for my acoustic guitar. So I'm going to saw a hole in my acoustic guitar and ah! install this. Yeah, it's exciting. It'll, it'll be fun to do and it'll be a good, uh, you know, um, good experience, a good demo to do. Like if you, if you paid $75 for your acoustic guitar, then you can afford to, you know, uh, saw a hole in it and it, you know, is is that thing is it arced so it fits like the curve part okay yeah yeah so you can you find that that part of the curve on your guitar and you match it to that so i'll show you how you do that uh, um in the video um yeah cool it. and then you're gonna mount it you have like tiny little wood screws or something um you know, I don't know where the screws are for it. I, they might be in a bag, but um, yeah, okay. it's got it's got holes for the screws. Okay. Um, and then a, a bunch of the other parts. It came with uh, some adhesive tabs, so you can you know glue down the, or you know stick down the um, the the cables in the inside the body, so they don't rattle around. Oh, okay, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm gonna put an end pin jack on it, so it, that'll be less disruptive than than putting a you know one in nice. the nice on the side yeah that sounds like a cool project yeah you know, what is that thing is it like a little eq and like some kind of microphone or amp or something yeah i think it's a little yeah. mixer it's got a uh, apertures on the bottom or um or inputs on the bottom for uh, for a microphone and the the pickup piezo pickup and i didn't get a microphone um like a little contact mic but i got the i could do that later but you can see it's just got like two inputs. Yeah. I believe that's what those are. Um, oh, so, so the piezo, are you going to, it, does it go in the bridge? Is it like yeah. a little, okay. So it goes, is it like a little strip or something that goes underneath that? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That's super interesting. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be a fun project and um, a good demo I think to do. Oh Yeah. Yeah, here it is. This is the uh, the piezo pickup. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that just drops in like right underneath the bone. Yeah. Bri the bridge piece. Yeah, so you have to drill a hole underneath. <clears throat> um, yeah, and feed the wire into the body. I get it. <clears throat> yeah. Nice. Oh, does it have like a little plug? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it just plugs into the bottom of this. Nice. Yeah, actually, one of these must be the output. So that goes into the, the jack, I think. 
Nice. Uh, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll find out everything when I when I'm doing the demo. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So, how about you? What have you been working on? You, I know you you finished that Vulcan last week. Yeah, yeah. So I I I, I wrapped up the Vulcan. I got it right here. My ink pad is going dead, so the ink didn't come out very good. I got to either get a new ink pad or I tried to revive the old one by putting a little alcohol on it because the ink is alcohol based, but it didn't work. Maybe, maybe it'll work if the ink, if it sits there for a little while, like maybe it'll, it'll revive. But anyway, I built one of these, this sounds great. And then, you know, what I did is uh, since uh, I, I, I had the boards made at Osh Park, right? So here's the board. I created a build document for it. So if anybody wants to build one of these, they can just order the boards on Osh Park. It's like $13 for three boards. So that's O-S-H-P-A-R-K? Yes, yeah. And you can just look for my name, look for Soggy Bag, and then there's Vulcan will be one of my builds. So I made that a public build. Like we don't get any money from that. It's just like the money goes to Osh Park, right? They um, they charge by the inch. So you're just basically paying for them to manufacture the boards for you, right? But it's kind of cool. It's like, you know, my contribution maybe to the DIY community, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think as far as overdrives go, I, I, I just had built a few overdrives. I did a Klon. I did the uh, Honey Drive. I did uh, a um, Tube Screamer. I did a Zen Drive. And I forget, I did, I think I did something else too. But, but anyway, and I did this one, right? And I, this sounds as good as any of those other ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's as good uh, as the Tube Screamer or the the Klon, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, the Klon is at the I think at the weekend of the of the overdrive spectrum, and this thing goes it runs the gamut. The Vulcan, I think, uh, you know, goes from like kind of like a light overdrive to almost a fuzz. And as you pointed out, it's a great pedal. Like if you could turn turn up the gain all the way to just use the volume knob on your guitar to vary the amount, like. You know, if you're playing the first part of your song or something like that, you can just turn the volume down a little bit and then crank it up for the, the chorus. Yeah, yeah, it works really good. I think it sounds great, you know. Um, out of all those, me personally, I thought actually the Klon, even though it has all the mojo and um, hype, uh, that was actually my least favorite of the, of the group. You know, I like this is pretty good. I, I really like this one. The Tube Screamer was okay. I, I really like the Honey Drive. Mm -hmm. And the Zen Drive was okay um, too. Uh, but out of those three, I think I like the Honey Drive best. And now I think like the Vulcan and the Honey Drive are my two favorite overdrives right now. You yeah. Know? I mean, this has overtaken uh, the uh, the Plimsoll, which is sort of like a double um, uh, uh, Tube Screamer. Like it's basically a Tube Screamer with an additional gain stage on it. And uh, this had been my my favorite, and at home I'd been using the Tube Screamer um, until you sent me the Vulcan, and that's just been that's been uh, in in the pedal chain the whole time since then. Yeah, it's pretty good. So yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd recommend anybody build one of these. I'm gonna build another one, so I got one more circuit board. So I'm gonna try and put put one of those up on my trade page. You know. Um, the bummer is like, nobody knows what it is. So like, mm -hmm. maybe I'll have to do a demo of it, you know, um, and post that. Yeah. I, I have a, a demo in the works. I have some, you know, technical difficulties to, to work out as well, but, uh, um, maybe we could combine them. I could, you know, um, do, do the, uh, the single coils, uh, demo or something and you could do the humbucker demo. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Something we'll like that. that. We'll figure it out. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I did that. I posted a couple things to the, or I got, I got an offer for, um, one of the bloom, the algal bloom pedals. Somebody wanted to trade a idiot box, um, dungeon master for it. So I was like, yeah, right on <laughs> a pedal called the dungeon master. Like I got to have one of those, you know? Plus, like we had talked about idiot box effects and it, it's kind of like that fit. guy's, I, I like that guy's website and his pedals look really interesting. So I thought like I should own one of those just to take a look at it, see what his construction technique is and see what kind of stuff he's making. So 
Um, so I said I'd, I'd, I'd trade for that. So the trade hasn't gone through yet, but we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully that'll happen, right? Um, you know, so that's where that's at. Cool. I, yeah, I'd like to see a demo of the of the dungeon master. Oh yeah, yeah. We got to do a dungeon master for sure. You know, the other thing I did is I I bought some of these circuit boards. This is like a super giant circuit board. You know. Um, this is uh, the parentheses fuzz from pedal PCB. Let's see like pedal PCB over here, right? You know, um, and it's like, a, it's actually like a clone of the life pedal, which is like, I think it's made by Earthquaker devices. And they, they did some kind of like overhyped run of these life pedals. And the life pedal is kind of like a signature pedal for the band Sun O. Hmm right so it was kind of their thing and it's it's like the like looking at the schematic it's basically like uh an octave fuzz and a rat distortion with some like mods right but essentially it's like a octave fuzz into the rat or actually you know what it's got a blend so there's a blend knob so you can blend the octave with the with the rat distortion you know oh interesting yeah, and then it has a knob that lets you choose some different clipping diode configuration too so um, so anyway, so I, I bought three of these. So I'm going to try and build up three of these and I'll probably keep one and then try and like trade the other two. Um, the thing is the circuit board is really big. So you got to put it in a bigger box. So I bought three of these giant, like these are like 1590 XX boxes. So they're, they're bigger than the standard ones. And I, I bought black. But then I realized later, originally I was going to mill the top of the box, but then I realized like these boxes are too big to fit in the mill. Oh. <laughs> like, so then I was kind of kicking myself because I think I'd rather have the bare metal and just stamp the enclosures like this if I'm not going to mill them. Mm -hmm. So um, so I don't know what I'm going to do now because um, I won't be able to mill that, but maybe, maybe I'll think of something creative. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, you could paint it. Maybe, yeah. With acrylics or something. Yeah, I um, I was thinking the other thing I was thinking about is I could stamp it with white ink because I have some white ink. It doesn't actually stamp very good. The white doesn't look that great, but uh, maybe I'll do that. Or the other thought I had is if I made like a, I could mill like a little aluminum plate and like rivet onto the top and that might look uh -huh. kind of cool. That's a good idea. That could look yeah. really cool. And it could be, I don't know, it's just a, different way to do it that you don't yeah. see all the time yeah so that's those are my options there um and maybe i'll think of something else so that's going to be in the works you know cool. yeah I've, I've been a, my new thing now is i i i write down i have this to-do list so i write it down on paper <laughs> and then like i don't forget you know so so i have a whole list a to-do list with a bunch of stuff on it so i got this the vulcan pedal i marked off my list I'm going to finish up this trem shifter. So this is still in the same spot it was last week because I did the Vulcan this week. Mm -hmm. And then I got this other thing over here. It's a, uh, it's the super frequency. This is actually an ugly face, but uh, so I got that and it's kind of almost working. It needs a little bit of, a little more work before that's done. So, so that's in the works. Um, and then uh, parentheses fuzz and a few other projects. Like, you know, so now that I got my to-do list, I can, I just check the list. Mm -hmm. I put uh, build shelves in the garage. So today, this morning, I, I built a shelf I, in the garage. <laughs> that kind oh, of that's great. Off. It kind of cleared off the bench. So I took everything off the bench and I moved it up to the shelf and now I kind of have a place to work again. So is that shop stuff that goes on the shelf or? Or the shop yeah. stuff goes on the bench. Oh, good question. Um, I took all the tools and crap and put it up on the shelf so I could have a place to work. Oh, okay, great. Okay. You know, I got a bunch of these two by fours in the garage too. So I think I'm going to try and build a couple more shelves. Like I just got the, the table saw out and I sawed them and, you know, built some shelf, built uh, one shelf, but I think I'm going to build a couple more. That's a really perfect, uh, you know, uh, Sunday afternoon uh, pandemic lockdown project. Yeah, yeah, and it was, it felt like oddly, <laughs> or not oddly, but you know, it felt like satisfying to complete it. You know, I spent mm -hmm. like an hour and had a shelf and 
<laughs> cleaned up some stuff so there's more space, you know. Yeah, well, we've both been talking about, uh, you know, cleaning the shop kind of projects, you know, cleaning the shop so you can work on your on your projects. Yeah, and, yeah, it really uh, helps. Like if you clean the table off or the desk yeah. or wherever you're working. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of got halfway and then I filled it up again with the parts that came in. But yeah, I, I didn't build shelves. Yeah, well, you, you have a different... Uh, organization system than I have. So, you know, right. Right. So, yeah. So anyway, hopefully that's going to make some space and, you know, open up some more possibilities. I'm off on Monday though. I have all this work to do. So I think I'm going to do some work at home on Monday for work, but then since I got the day off, I'm going to do some, maybe I'll work on something on Monday. Maybe I'll get this trim shifter going on Monday, you know, it's be a Monday project. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I got this box full of circuit boards. Actually, I got like a, two boxes. I got this box full of circuit boards here. So there's a bunch of stuff in here to build, you know. Well, I'm, I'm gaining on you slowly. I've only got like six circuit boards that I have to make. <laughs> only <into pedals>. six. <laughs> only six. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. I got to work on that. Yeah. Uh, all of my projects seem to be cut guitars right now yeah what about that eddie van halen passed away yeah yeah eddie was a you know he was he was a do-it-yourselfer he was a oh know, yeah one of the first i mean of course less paul but i mean eddie van halen um you know he invented the frankenstrat uh the the super strat really um, actually i think i think eddie van halen and les paul actually have a lot in common yeah. Even yeah. like almost even in playing style a little bit, you know, they have different, mm. totally different genres of music, but the way like Les Paul, like his picking, you know, he was like really fast picker, you know, and mm -hmm. Van Halen kind of does that too, going up and down the neck, you know? Yeah. I never thought about that. You know? Like, but yeah, guys like that, they don't come along every day. Um, no. It's it's weird though uh, the effect that um, that his death had on on YouTube and Instagram and you know probably Facebook and wherever else but uh, you know people who have never met Eddie Van Halen in their life were you know uh, they were uh, emo streaming uh, that day. Yeah. I'd, I'd say like Van Halen was kind of a uh, virtuoso, you know, like absolutely. He, yeah. He's like one of those people that could just play and be totally entertaining without the band, mm -hmm. you know? And then also in the context of the band, like he could fill out all the space, you know, and, and tastefully, you know, like, you know what I mean? Without kind of running over stuff or sounding like he's kind of not part of the, of the thing, you know? Absolutely. Not yeah. Story. I had read something that uh, apparently like early on they had had a, a keyboard player and, and, and Van Halen was like, nah, he's just filling too much space. I guess I have more room. To... And, you know, I guess Van Halen, you know, he's, you know, he's kind of got big ideas. So, you know, he needed mm -hmm. some more space. They had to kind of push the keyboard player out, you know, you know, no, actually, that's good. I think the, 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 whatever empty space that there is left is, is really, you know, it's really profound or it's, or it's pronounced because, you know, they are such a like in your face band, but they're never a wall of sound. It's just really punchy music. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those they're, they're kind of great, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I the, the, here's a funny memory is I remember when I was in high school, you know, and, and Van Halen had played the solo on beat it. And I remember mm -hmm. I, I overheard some other kids talking and they were like, you know, they were like, they were like, you know, Van Halen did the solo on Beat It, but then it was kind of like in the, the, the gist of the conversation was like, I don't know if we're cool with that. You know, like, that's not cool. You know, like Van Halen is Van Halen. He's not like, he doesn't play for Michael Jackson. You know, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just remember overhearing that conversation, you know. <laughs> but it's such a great solo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you know. I, you know, I, I can see it because Michael Jackson's like the, you know, he's the king of pop. He's not, yeah. he's not a rocker. 
Um, but you know, like he collaborated with uh, with Eddie Van Halen, and he collaborated with Steve Stevens, and then you know later on he collaborated with Slash. So he's you know he's got a history of collaborating with some really heavy guitarists. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and Van Halen, like um, besides like you know being the major you know virtuoso, is also like this kind of inventor. You know, like he. Mm -hmm. I read this article. It was in popular mechanics it was like kind of an interview with him and and you know he basically said yeah you know my dad used to invent shit it just like when i was young me and my brother we'd see my dad invent stuff and so you know it gave us it told us like hey you can just make things you know and, and mm -hmm. you know if you don't have something you could just make something to, to work for you and so he just said he did everything like that you know he was like my guitar didn't do this thing so i i tore all the like you know my guitar like it would fret out when you bend the notes so I took all the frets off, sanded the the fretboard flatter, put new frets on it, <laughs> right? Wow. You know, and then That's he said, uh, he said that, I like this part, he said that, um, you know, the feedback, the pickups would feedback, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he heard like if you dipped them in wax, right? If you, so he says, yeah, I got, I got a coffee tin. I boiled up some wax paraffin and I, I dipped the pickups in, but he said he ruined a few pickups because if you didn't take them out fast enough, like the the plastic would start to melt because it was too hot uh-huh so it'd get all warped you know so he ruined a couple you know but you know the way i heard it he was he was the one who innovated that for guitar pickups uh, oh like did I, he invent that yeah crazy that's that's what i read recently but i don't know if that's actually um if that's true yeah yeah i don't know i just remember i read it like he said he did it in the in the um popular mechanics article right what else did he say? He said, he said like, yeah, my amp wasn't, sound, I, 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 all I found was that like you could, like, well, he was like, you know, what the sound that I wanted was when you turn the Marshall up all the way, right? That was the sound I wanted, but I couldn't play like that even with the band there. Like, so even if we were in the, like at home, I couldn't do it, it was just too loud. The neighbors would complain, you know, right? But even with the band in the practice space, like he said, he tried all these things, like he'd point the amp at the wall He'd point that he'd put the amp face down and it was still too loud. <laughs> right? And so then he said he got inside the amp and he was like tinkering with stuff. And then he's like, one day, like I touched this capacitor and it was just like I got punched in the chest by like, like by Michael Tyson or something, you know. Right. Of course, like those amps, they have like three or four hundred volts in them. Right. Like, you know, it's got a step up transformer. I, I think it can even be like six hundred volts, you know, on some of them. Right. I don't know what the Marshalls run at, but like. You know, wow, you could you could have just like died right there and we never would have heard of it. Oh, I know. <laughs> like, yeah. But uh, but yeah, he said he just got into his amp and he was like tinkering with it. He was trying to get the sound at lower volume. And then he ran into this thing. It was a um, called a variac. So uh, basically it lets you turn the, the voltage down. Right. Or you can control the voltage going into the amp so you could control the voltage, but turn the amp all the way up, you know. And so that let him get get this that sound, you know. Mm -hmm. You know who does that too is um, uh, Alan Haldsworth. Like he's a jazz guy, but he actually, you know, what's funny is if you listen to Haldsworth and, and you listen to Van Halen, Van Halen, you'll hear some Haldsworth the way that like Haldsworth is all about um, uh, this legato, like where he's just like, blah, 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 but like, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the smooth hammer-ons and pull-offs, you know? Right. And Van Halen will do a lot of that, too. And I remember hearing another or reading another interview with him where he was like, he's like, yeah, you know, when I was in high school, I had this cassette tape of Alan Haldsworth and I just go listen to it with my friends. And we're like, how the hell does he do this? You know, like, you know, so obviously he was like on a mission to just like, you know, just absorb like all the greatest techniques, you know, and, mm -hmm. and make them his own thing, you know. But, uh, but Haldsworth like did a thing where like essentially like he's got the amp turned up to 11 and then he's got like, uh, you know, like, like uh, you know, those elements that you have in your toaster oven. Yeah. So imagine those are like these giant resistors, right? So he's got the signal going through those. I, from what I understand, it's going through some of these things, right? And then to the speaker. 
So imagine you have the power amp and the amp turned up to 11, like it's just all the way up. But then to keep the volume down, it's going through these like these elements, right? To cut down the voltage going to the speaker, you know, like, right? So it's kind of like Van Halen kind of did a similar thing, but he used the Variac, which is kind of like a, it's like a rheostat or like a, um, like a big potentiometer for large voltage, like for right. hundreds of volts, you know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd like to get uh, something like that for my um, for my tube amps so I can play at home with that, you know, with the low volume, but it's, I'm not as venturous as uh, Eddie Van Halen. I don't want to get punched in the chest by Mike Tyson. Yeah. Hey, you know, I have a thing that's got, I bought it for like 20 or maybe like 40 bucks, you know, and it's basically like you, you plug the power amp into this box it's got a knob on it and then it then the other side goes to the speaker and it's got a oh. rheostat in it it's kind of like the alan haldsworth thing but kind of cheap so yeah. i could just do that to my blues junior without uh without yeah. soldering yeah I'll, I'll loan it to you you could make your own like buying the parts but like and the one i have is like it's totally cheap ass like you know diy thing i just got it on the internet but uh, i'll loan it to you if you want i tried it on my app it works you know that like if you're a if, if you're a tone person, you're probably going to like, you know, sniff, you know, like, oh, I'm losing some highs or like it because it, do, it does it does affect the sound a little bit. But but if you want to crank your amp up and turn the volume down, it totally works. Uh, I mean, it, it's worth a shot. The, uh, you know, the, uh, the the Blues Junior is a great sounding amp and I'm never going to be able to play it at my apartment. Um at even its lowest volume, I think so. Yeah, that's uh, actually, I have the same issue. Like I have these two amps. Um, I got the, the basement and then I have this other amp that I made. It's kind of like a Marshall 18 watt or something, but it's 30, the, it's the Marshall clone is like 36 watts, but the, I gotta get back in there and see if I can fix this because the volume control it's super touchy. Like just the very first eighth of an inch goes from like nothing to like super loud. Right. Um, and that's super annoying because the, the basement has like this smooth range of volume. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> you just turn it, you can turn it way down. You can turn it up. You can turn it up just a little bit. You know, and it's actually, so like I end up using the basement more often because it's easy to play at a lower volume. You know, the other amp, I want to use it more, but then it's like, it's just, it's just loud or louder. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have like a medium or quiet, you know, thing. What do you have to do to, um, to get it dialed in? You know, I don't know. Maybe I just got to replace the pot. You know, I had tried a couple things. I like, I'm not that great with the amp stuff, you know, so, um, I'm kind of new to it. Mm. Um, but I tried replacing the pot and that didn't kind of work. That didn't work. Uh, maybe if I put a different pot in there with a, like a larger value, you know, or maybe that pot is just stupid. Like it's maybe, I don't know, the, it, it doesn't have the right curve to it. You know, it's like a linear rather than an exponential pot or something. I don't know. Right. Yeah. So, I was wondering about that. So yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll replace that, you know, it, the, the bummer is it's not easy to do because you got to take the whole amp apart to get the chassis out. Mm -hmm. You know, it just take it takes it's like a lot of work to 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 get it open to get to the pot. You know, so anyway, maybe maybe I'll put that on my to do list. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. I I should write a to do list. I've got a lot of things, um, you know, in on the the old mental to do list, and um, I I forget to do them. Yeah. Yeah, well, especially like if you order parts, then mm -hmm. if it takes a week or two to come, then you get distracted or you forget like what you ordered these parts for, you know, sometimes you can take like a month because you wait a couple weeks for the parts and then you got to wait a week or two before you can get around to doing it. And then a month later, you're like, you're on to some other project or you forget, you know. Yep, I have projects like that. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, it's like I, I, uh, I was talking with the, the band guys about um like tube um you know tube sniffing basically like uh replacing the tubes in your in your tube amp for a you know better tone and so well so 
Ryan, he he bought a bunch of tubes and he just kind of did like a like a taste test. He doesn't listen to a bunch of them. Um, I don't know if I've got the you know the the patience to to do that, but I I'd like to find some some cool Blues Junior mods and um, and and see what I can see what I can do. I, I bet if you Google on the internet, there's probably plenty of Blues Junior mods because Blues Junior is a pretty popular amp. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm sure people have modded that amp. I don't know what kind of tubes you have in there, but if you if you have the 12 AX7s, there's I forget the, the model number. It's like 7SBY or something like that. But there's a, there's like a low power version of the 12 AX7. Oh, interesting. And okay, that's so actually be like my yeah. home, home uh, uh, jamming thing. Yeah, yeah. That's actually like a like a, a mod is you can put the lower gain um, the lower gain preamp tube in there, you know? Right. Cool. Yeah. Well, that'll, I'll make some videos about that too. Yeah. I might have one of those too. I have a, I have a few tubes lying around here. I'm not like super into the tubes. Um, you know, though, though, though I, the, my, my basement has this, it's kind of, it's super subtle. Okay. But if you, if you play, it sounds great, but if you listen really carefully, and you play like E, like the note E, there's this little tiny like sound in there, like a little rattle that shows up. And on other notes, you don't hear it, right? Um, and I kind of wonder if that's like one of the tubes is going bad, you know, just starting to go bad, you know? Mm. I actually, like you can, you can really can't hear it, you know, unless you really listen for it. But like once I started noticing it, if I play clean, like I'll always notice it. And then I noticed like it only shows up on certain notes and it's like E. And I kind of wonder if, you know, people were playing lots of E, like E music, you know, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. after a while, like some little part in there started to rattle or come loose, you know, from from that particular frequency. I, I don't know, you know, I'm just. Yeah. Or maybe it's just like a, a part of the amp that rattles to the, the key of E, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. Design. Yeah. Is yeah. I don't, know. I don't want to buy because it's so subtle. Like it's like, I don't want to buy new tubes just because that, but it does kind of bug me though. Though I usually don't notice if you have a fuzz box on, you can't tell, but if you play clean, like I'll hear it, you know, if I listen really carefully, you know, but so otherwise it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a deal breaker or anything, you know, that's a great it, sounding amp. Yeah. It does sound pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, here's another Van Halen story just for fun. So I seem to remember too, you know, like the tapping thing, right? Like he mm -hmm. got onto that kind of early on. And, um, I, I guess apparently like, you know, he would do that live, but he would always turn his back to the audience. Mm. It's kind of a secret. He's like, yeah, I don't want to let this out, this cat out of the bag. Cause it's my, my shtick right now, you know? So he'd turn his back to the audience and he'd, he'd do the tapping thing, you know? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I'd heard this other, I, I heard this other, um, or I watched this, uh, this documentary, you know, it's kind of like a low budget documentary on Van Halen. And they said that, um, you know, they play these parties in, in LA. Right. And apparently like, like hundreds of people would show up. They just do it in somebody's backyard. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a big deal, but it was before they had a record deal. So people would show up and it would just be like mobbed with people. Like you'd be like blocks away and there'd just be so many cars on the street. You couldn't, you know, <laughs> you couldn't get in there. The police would show up and shut it down, you know. And they said that they they had hired David Lee Roth, right? They needed a new singer. They had, I guess they had some other guy and he quit or something. And so they got David Lee Roth and they got Roth because he had a PA. And, his, oh, and yeah. I guess his dad would let them practice in the basement, <laughs> right? And, and then they said, nobody liked David Lee Roth because he had such an attitude. He was so pompous. And, you know, they, they were like, yeah, he'd show up dressed in all this weird clothes and he'd walk in with a cane, you know, like, you know, like he was just totally playing out the thing. And then they said something happened, like nobody liked Roth. And then after a while, people started to like him. <laughs> they just started to get into his personality. <laughs> you know, but like, you know what I mean? They were like, at some point, like the, they kind of gave in to the, the grandiose, you know, persona, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I think he proved himself. I mean, if you come out of nowhere with that attitude, you have to prove yourself. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I was listening 
him, uh, oh, well, I was listening to Van Halen um, the other day, um, my way home from work, and uh, uh, I think it was Beautiful Girls or some song like that. Um, yeah. And he really, he really sells a song, you know, like, you know, like a, uh, you know, like Dean Martin or somebody like that back in the day, they really, they know what it takes to sell that song to the listener. And um, he, he didn't hold back anything. Um, he was, he was a good match for Eddie. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you've seen those videos. They were like totally physical. Like they'd all be just jumping in the air. And like, mm -hmm. <laughs> apparently like when they first got their, their, you know, you know, apparently like, uh, um, who's the guy from kiss the bass player gene simmons right mm -hmm. so apparently gene simmons had got on to van halen and he worked with them and they recorded a demo and gene simmons was gonna produce them right you know um and so he shopped their demo around and no one would take it that's insane what? so like gene simmons was gonna sell van halen to the world and then and the world was like we're not ready yet you know <laughs> and and so, so Gene, Gene just said, okay, guys, sorry, I tried my best. Here's your demo tape, you know? And then they took it around and they managed to get someone to buy it. And they put them on the bill with, with Black Sabbath and they toured with Black, so they opened for Black Sabbath, right? And apparently like they just blew Black Sabbath off, Black Sabbath off the stage. Like, cause they were just totally physical, just like rocking out just a million miles an hour and black sabbath is this chugging slow and they just kind of stand there like if you've ever seen like a uh, live footage of black sabbath they don't like ozzy's got his hands up but everybody else is just kind of standing there like they don't do anything right. and they even said like you know black sabbath was like oh my god you guys are amazing like you guys are blowing us off the stage you know, like, you know? i don't know if you've ever seen any videos too they just totally they're just like flying in the air jumping oh off. yeah it's super yeah. physical, you know? Yeah. No, I remember uh, like when I was in junior high and everybody had these Van Halen t-shirts and there's like four pictures and every member is like in the air <laughs> and like they've got like bandanas tied around their legs and their neck and, you know. <laughs> yeah. And there's like sweat flying everywhere, you know, sweat and yeah. hair, just like it was very, um, uh, it was, it was, it was a sight to behold. Yeah, I remember reading an interview with them and they said, uh, I used to go to the, to the library and, you know, read Guitar Player magazine because they had it in the magazine rack at the library, you know, so, like I didn't have to buy it. I just, like I was in high school, right? So I didn't have any money, you know, just go to the library and read it. And I remember reading an interview and they were like, oh yeah, we totally work out before the tour. Like they were like, yeah, we just totally like, we're like working out like constantly, like, you know. Yeah. Um they would have died otherwise um there was that guy uh from morphine that um he died on stage just from being out of shape and being a heavy smoker like he didn't <laughs> <laughs> like i mean i shouldn't laugh at that it's kind of sad but you know well, it's, it's kind of funny great but... great singer and a great band and it's it is sad but like man you gotta you gotta get on get in shape if you're gonna like you know do if you're going to perform in front of a big audience on a hot day, uh, you got to be in some kind of shape. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, I think too, like, you know, for Van Halen, like they pretty much gave their energy to the audience. So you went to a Van mm -hmm. Halen concert and you were fucking pumped because the band was like rocking so hard. You know what I mean? Right. Like it yeah. wasn't like, it wasn't like you went there and you were like, like tapping your foot or something like you were jumping up and down, you know, <laughs> like, you know right well, yeah, yeah that was their goal like i remember hearing david lee roth talk about how they wanted everybody to be flying when they came out of the show oh yeah for sure yeah yeah they were pretty good you know um anyway <laughs> there we go you know yeah it's a, it's a heavy loss yeah i mean it's it, this this last stretch you know we've lost some amazing artists you know prince david bowie um and now van halen and, and so many more but you know it's just like it's been well as somebody said i think it was like um philip mcknight just like he just if you grew up on van halen you never thought of this day coming 
Yeah. Well, you know, the thing, the thing that I'd say here is that we we're also losing like guitar players, like, like young people don't play guitar these days or usually, you know, it's like people are making music in other ways. So they're not, you know, there isn't like that guitar. Nobody wants to be the guitar virtuoso these days. You know, even when people are playing guitar, like people kind of snub the idea of being like highly technically proficient. Like it's not, you know, that's not a goal, you know? Mm -hmm right anymore right like yeah. when i grew up that's what everybody grew up with right it was like you know um you know van halen and um who's the guy that was in ozzy's band i forget he died in a plane crash oh yeah yeah um uh, yeah it's just a, a brain fart uh yeah i know we're getting old you know yeah and, and then steve vi too you know mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember like Steve Vai, like he came out with an album. I think he was probably like 17 or some ridiculously young age. And he came out with this album called, I think it was called Flexible. Had this thing on it called the Attitude Song. And it was like, it's just like crazy. It's like in 7-4 and just like super nutty, like crazy guitar playing with crazy whammy bar mm -hmm. action, you know, totally. Well, like you know, it got him that job of playing with David Lee Roth when he went, when he went solo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it got him the job with uh, Frank Zappa, too. But oh, I think, yeah. like, in a lot of ways, I wouldn't be surprised if, and I'm, I'm sure this is, like, uh, you know, Steve Vai was inspired by by Eddie Van Halen. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, you could you can hear, like, what he took from Van Halen and did his, you know, and went his own direction with it, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, he really did, you know, innovate so much. And I, my, my dad was asking me what... Uh, what uh, what was special about Eddie Van Halen's guitar? And so I kind of like had to explain, you know, how the the Floyd Rose and the you know um, heavy gain and the two the the two handed tapping technique. Um, and I sent him that uh, that video from there's like a clip in uh, the movie Back to the Future where Marty McFly uses Eddie Van Halen's music as uh, like a torture device to his his dad to try to convince him to ask out his mom he puts these headphones on him and he blasts him with some eddie van halen <laughs> nice so, that's um, super funny like, yeah to somebody my dad's age that's probably you know a good introduction to to van halen yeah that's super funny oh well well we'll have to just see what what happens you know can the world recover right yeah, I think I think I, I, I'm going to be optimistic. I think I think we'll recover at some point. I don't know when. Yeah, I think we will. I think who's we gonna, will. I mean, who's going to bring the rock, you know? Well, you know, Fender's had, I think, their best year ever. Um, maybe even like 2020 was their best year ever because, you know, people are stuck at home. There's a lot of women who are learning how to play guitar and um they've made it really easy for people to buy online and i don't know um yeah i've heard they really well. um they're like their marketing like unlike gibson which gibson's their marketing is kind of weird you know like all they do is come up with reissues of like guitars from the 50s you know mm -hmm. it's like they're marketing to us yeah yeah and then they're expensive too but fender apparently is making very affordable guitars and they're also um I think one of the things they realized was that people needed resources to learn how to play the instrument. Otherwise right. they didn't want an instrument. So they were, they're supplying all these resources for people to learn, mm -hmm. you know, they got entry level instruments that are actually super cool. Yeah. You know, like the instruments are very well made and like, they're just cool instruments to play. And then, and then they have the resources to learn to play on the Fender site. So, so I think Fender's doing something right there. You know, they're kind of keeping the, the flame alive or the torch lit for, for guitar playing you know yeah yeah I, i'm pretty impressed with uh you know with the the business that they're doing and and fender play i mean i didn't personally enjoy the their app but you know it's for somebody who's uh who's just starting out it'd be great um there's a bunch of other things like musician um oh yeah why are you musician um uh <clears throat> again i don't know if that's going to help anybody learn how to play but you know it's like you kind of if you if you really spend the time you really you know you kind of get um that 
that tactile, you know, you, when you play a note and then you play you know, the next note, you sort of understand the intervals and things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, um, the Fender play, it's, it's like a, a good introduction to chords and how, you know, stringing them together in a certain way gets you a song. Yeah, musicians kind of interesting because they don't have like commercial music or music that you've heard. And I think this hurts them, but it also kind of maybe helps them a little bit, um, mm -hmm. you know, so because they don't they don't license any of the music. So all the songs that they have on there are original, right? Because then they don't have to pay for the license, right? Um, the other thing, though, about them is that it's kind of a game. And I think like young people are into video games. I think I feel right. like video games are like a new f narrative form that mm -hmm. people follow. Like when I was young, you know, you you could play, you could put a quarter in an arcade game and play down at the pizza parlor. And I played, I probably spent like hundreds of hundreds of dollars at at <laughs> you know playing Defender and Asteroids. You know, <laughs> money well spent. Yeah, it was great, you know, but uh, but it was a different thing. It wasn't a narrative. It was just right. like, hey, let's waste some time, you know, at the at the pizza parlor, right? Um, but nowadays, I but the narrative for me was like TV or books, right? And nowadays, mm -hmm. I think that um, you know people don't watch TV. There is some of that, but I think nowadays people get their narrative from video games. So you follow mm -hmm. like a video game, and so like musician kind of feeds into that because it's it's a game like experience, right? Right. Well, the uh, of the of the kind of like beginner guitar teacher video games that I've encountered, I think a uh, Rocksmith is one of the best. That's the one where you plug your guitar into your PlayStation and you play along a lot like um, uh, Rock Band or uh, Guitar Hero, but you use a real guitar and you you know, you can hear the audience cheering for you when you actually do a good job. And it starts you off where, you know, you're playing the actual song on your real guitar, but you're only playing like two strings instead of four strings, or, you know, you're not playing the whole chord at first and then you build up. So I thought that worked really well. Yeah, cool. I, 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 I haven't played that, but I've seen it and it looks pretty cool. Like you just plug your guitar and you play your guitar musician is kind of like that too but you just like somehow it just uses the microphone and it just listens to the audio right figures out what you're playing which is kind of genius it's it works pretty good i mean i guess a lot of like whatever the technology is behind that they've got it figured out because there's a lot of guitar pedals that do that nowadays like all those um electro harmonics like the b9 and the you know, the Mel 9 and stuff like mm -hmm. that, right? They all have, um, they do the same thing. Like you can play your guitar and it sounds like a synthesizer, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it basically distinguishes each of the six strings. So you can play like a six string chord, you know, and you don't, you don't need to have like a special pickup or any, you know, computer, you know, or anything right. like that. It's just the pedal. Yeah, it's truly amazing how much better that technology is, has gotten. And you don't need like a, you know, like a weird second, or you know like an additional pickup like you had on those roland guitars back in the day yeah yeah it's pretty it's pretty amazing right <clears throat> so the technology is pretty good these days you know hey so yeah. uh so what's your goal for this week what are you working on well i gotta i gotta um get that guitar from my brother ready um to send off to minneapolis um so I'll be, that'll be my, probably my first order of business. Um, I'm, I'm kind of jonesing to do some soldering though. So I think I'm going to, you know, order the parts. Uh, I know I've promised to do that for the last four weeks, but I'm ordering <laughs> guitar parts uh, every week. Um, so yeah, I want to, I want to get started on that. The, the trem shifter. You've inspired me. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, how about this? I'm, I'm going to try and get mine going and then um, you can hear it and it'll inspire you because it'll sound so okay. great. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah. yeah, other than that, other than like building projects, I, I, I want to get some, uh, some demos of, of things done and, and online. So there'll be some guitar playing this week. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. I should do some of that. I'm going to put that on my list of to do is like, I don't know, do some music, you know? Yeah, I, I've got some songs that I, I need to like make some more serious recordings of, more, more serious demos so I can kind of finish them up and um, move on. You know, it's like, it's it's not good to have like 
a thousand song fragments that aren't connected to anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I gotta I gotta work on something too, you know. Maybe I'll think try and think so how about you? What are you gonna work on this week? Um oh, like I got this, I'm gonna work on these pedals that I got here. So I'm gonna try and wrap up um this trem shifter, I think is my next project. You know, and then maybe I'll build this other um Vulcan to right and then i got the parentheses fuzz and this ugly face so that's enough stuff i don't know if oh, i can yeah. finish all that in the week but but that should be enough to work on you know yeah yeah well so with all that you probably aren't spending a lot of time surfing reverb <laughs> uh, but i did see that you uh put uh put a guitar in the notes um that you've been looking at oh which one was that let's see it um let's see what was it Yeah, which one was that? It was that Mazrite. It was a it's a Mazrite clone by Eastwood. Oh. It's yeah, it's very much like a like a like one of those harmony guitars, like the um like the U2 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like a I think it's just the body, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's the one. It kind of looks like a Telecaster a little bit, but it's the Mosrite shape, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I put that on there because I thought, like, actually, it's a hundred bucks. So, mm. like, I was like, hmm, that's actually kind of like almost like a deal if you had a neck. Yeah. So, if you had a neck lying around that would fit this body for a hundred bucks, you'd get like the body with the pickups and the pick guard and the knobs and stuff, right? And I, I don't know, for me, that it was like, hey, that's almost like a deal. You know, I guess fifteen dollars shipping isn't bad either, right? Right. So yeah. that's why that's why I put that on there, as I thought like that's not a bad deal. Well, I'm sorry to say it's been sold. Yeah. Well, that's that proves my point that it right. was kind of a deal. <laughs> oh, well, I was looking at this, um, the Gibson All American. I don't know if you can see that. But, uh, oh yeah, let me check, take a look at that. It's a pretty cool. It. Oh yeah. I, you know, when the, when you see them in the and they're like all black, it's kind of boring. But like basically, it's a melody maker with two pickups and a strat type trim. So that seems like kind of a cool little guitar. And that one that I just showed is uh, it's going for six hundred. It's got some mods. It's got a Seymour Duncan um, um, P rail in the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's kind of cool. I like that shape. Like, that's mm -hmm. kind of like a, one of my favorite shapes, you know. Um, I don't know about the trem on the Gibson, though. Though, actually, you know, I, I, I seem to remember Eddie Van Halen having a Les Paul with a, with a Floyd Rose. So, oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. That guy from Rush, Alex Lifeson, has one of those too. Yeah, it's a, a couple people model. that they're like, "We'll play Gibson, but you got to give me my tremolo." I'm just yeah. like, I can't play without the tremolo, you know. You know, but yeah, this is kind of cool. It looks pretty beat up though, so I, I don't know if it's like supposed to be aged or relicked or something, but it looks pretty beat. Well, I mean, that guitar is probably from the '80s. Oh, is it that old? I think it is. Yeah. Huh. Um, oh no, it's from '96. Yeah, well, I guess that's still pretty old. That's like 20 years, right? Right. 25 years old, 24 years old. Yeah. You know, the tremolo, uh, the alternative tremolo for, for Gibson guitars would be that um, Vibrola. Oh, yeah. And um, some people... Or, or, or the, the, the Bigsby. Oh, the Bigsby, yeah. Um, I guess the Bigsby would probably be a more expensive tremolo than the vibrola traditionally but um like these days you can get a big speed actually you can get a big speed clone for 20 bucks on, uh, on ebay really that's cheap that's a deal yeah this this tremolo costs 20 dollars wow is it is it big speed it's a it copy. It's, it's a, a copy it's copy. not even licensed it's probably illegal to buy is it just like the Bigsby or something or just or similar to it's way more similar to the Bigsby than anything that Guitar Fetish makes. Um, OK, I have a, a similar type of uh, tremolo from Guitar Fetish, but this is 
about as close as you can get to uh, a Bigsby B5 as, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything is this, exactly the same mechanics. I think these these sticks, the little, you know, uh, string mount things might be a little bit longer. Everything, it looks cheaper. It's not nickel plated, it's chrome. Um, I haven't really tested the spring weight or anything like that. Um, but you know, if it's anything like the functionality of a Bigsby, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds pretty good for 20 bucks. Geez, you know, I can't beat that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Hey, should we should we wrap up? Got anything to say in closing? Um, how about uh, what have you been listening to? Oh, you know what I was listening to recently was resin. Resin? Yeah, R-E-Z-N. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's a cool. Different yeah, they're spelling. kind of like this, like psychedelic doom thing, you know. But then they kind of have the synthesizer stuff in the background that's kind of good, you know. I don't know. I was just listening to them the other day, and I was like, kind of getting into this kind of psychedelic thing that they had going on, you know. I will check that out. I'm a fan of uh, psychedelic. Yeah, they're pretty psychedelic, you know. Um, you know, and then I was digging the synthesizer sounds, you know, they had like mm -hmm. some good wah pedal guitar playing, but it was like, it was like that clean guitar wah sound, you know, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, kind of pentatonics, you know, cool. It was, it was kind of good. So I was listening to some resin. You know? Right on. That sounds good. They're, and they're on Bandcamp. So, okay, cool. Yeah. I don't, I don't know about this, this band that um, Jamie turned me on to this band called uh, Heinz or Heinz, H-I-N-D-S. They're from Madrid. Yeah. And they're like an all-girl kind of, uh, I don't know, they, they kind of reminded me of uh, Melody's Echo Chamber but with a little bit more kind of a J-pop sound for some reason. Hmm. Um, they're cool. Um, but yeah, I, I will listen to Resin. That sounds, um, that sounds special. Uh, it's R-E-Z-N. I'm sorry? R-E-Z-N. Okay, yeah, it's a nice, easy spelling. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that kind of reminds me of like uh, that Bike Hunter or whatever, I, that band that um, um, just appeared on my phone um, somehow. Oh, yeah, actually, I like those guys. I should go listen to that again. I remember you turned me on to those and I listened to them like last year. They're on my band camp. Um, I should go. I should go take another listen. You yeah, I was listening to him again last week. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, you know who else I like on Bandcamp is. Um, let me see if I can find them again. Uh, yeah, I'll just say this while you're looking for that. It's uh, it to me that's what Prague has become. Like, if you think you don't like Prague, try listening to these guys. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, they're. I thought they're pretty good. Um, I, mean, I remember listening, going like, "Hey, this is pretty inspiring." You know, it's had a lot of kind of cool arrangement. You know. Yeah. It was mostly like instrumental too, which was kind of cool. Right. Yeah, I don't recall there being any vocals on it. Yeah. What was the other band I was listening to um, that kind of similar in a similar vein um, was shit. Now I can't find them. Let me see. Oh, you know why? Because they're in the other list here. That's why. Oh, Mono Myth. Mono Myth. Oh, was that the name of the band? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember. I remember hearing that. Yeah. So that was pretty good. I I, I should get back and listen to that again. You know, because it's like you listen to the album a couple times and then you're like, I'm gonna move on. But like, actually, it always pays to go back and listen later. You know. Yeah, especially when you know a band is as interesting and not mainstream as a band like that. Um, you know, it'd be one thing if, if if it's like the, you know, Demi Lovato, you know, big summer song hit, you know, top 40 
thing. Like you don't really need to listen to that over and over to kind of get the the hidden jewels. But uh, yes, I think I think a lot of that. that um, A lot of that music is it's 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 designed to be um, it's designed to be absorbed over time. Yeah, yeah. I feel though, like I guess for me, you know, you know what it is is like I listen to it and then I'm like, oh, I want to listen to something new, you know. So I'm always like, like I always think more is better. Cause like, Oh, I hear, you know, I've heard of an, another new band or I run into something new. So I want to listen to it, you know? Right. Um, you know, and you think you're, you think, well, I've already heard it. So I'll, I'll move on, you know, but I, I don't know. I think like, I gotta, I gotta like discipline myself to like dig deeper, you know? Like, uh, yeah. I mean, you visit stuff, you know, I, I really think there's something to like um, giving an album some time to, to stretch out and to, you know, um, to appreciate those more subtle textures and you know like if you've seen a movie like if there's any movie that you've watched more than 10 times you find something new to appreciate where you're not distracted by the reveal of the events of the movie um you know what i mean oh yeah i i enjoy that when something kind of really just opens up yeah Oh yeah. Yeah. I think when I go back and listen to something that I think I'm familiar with, uh, I start to, you know, pay more attention to the arrangement or to the background, you know, or to the dynamics, you know? Yeah. You know, so, so yeah, I gotta go, I gotta do that. Maybe that's gotta be the new thing is that, like, instead of just always listening to the new thing, because music takes time. So you have to dedicate a certain amount of time to absorb it. You know, maybe I got to make it a point of listening to something old and listen to something new, you know, maybe kind of oh, trade yeah. off, you know, make that like the new habit, a listening habit, you know? Yeah. I like that. Maybe I got to put a, maybe I got to do that. I got to add it to my list. So I got a list of to do projects. Maybe I got to have a list of a listen projects, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I, I, I enjoy listening to other people's process or hearing about, you know, how people get into music. There's a, a kid at work who um, he's got a, like a, a playlist of new music and, um, you know, uh, he won't listen to it on speakers with anybody else around until he's heard it the first time. He's got to vet it and make sure that he's not going to, you know, embarrass himself the first time. <laughs> But then he'll go back and listen to it again to see how it, you know, how it opens up. Yeah, I, don't, okay. I don't know. It's like, it's just, it's one, one process. Well, I, I thank him for that. So he's not going to, you know, torment me with terrible music. <laughs> <something>. Right. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it's, it, what's terrible, you know, like, I mean, I, I like a lot of bad music. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm sure well, I do well, too. Sometimes like what you consider like low quality is actually kind of good and it's kind of fun, you know, <laughs> you know, sometimes I just don't appreciate things the first time too. So you think it's not that great, but then like with the second listen, you're like, oh, wait a minute, you know, or in a different mindset, you listen to something and you get it, you know, the second right. or third time, you know. Right. So I mean, and a lot of times, like if you recommend music to somebody or, or somebody recommends music to me, and I'm not in the place to listen to that music right now, I won't, it'll, it'll be repellent. Um, so I, I just need to be in the right place to, you know, the right state of mind to listen to that at that moment. Oh, for sure. Yeah, totally. Right. So anyway, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll make that a listen, you know, um, you know, make, make that, I don't know, have to, have to, have to make that a new thing, right. Go yeah. back and revisit some, some old music, you know, yeah, it's something to try. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got some new things to listen to too. So, you know, okay, cool. Should we, should we wrap it up? Do you have anything else to add? No, I, I think we've, I, you know, we've covered, um, covered a lot of, of subject matter. Um, um, you know, Eddie Van Halen, um, you'll be missed. But, <laughs> What he left behind is incredible. 
Yeah, he was only 65 too. Like, wow, I'm, I'm 55. Like, you know, like I want to live past 65. That's only 10 years. I could like, you know. Yeah. Like, wow, you know. But I think I'm, I'm sure yeah, the guy- young. I'm sure the guy packed like 120 years into his 65, you know, like 120 years of living. Absolutely. You, know? you probably had some pretty dense yeah, but he, living in there, you know? Yeah. And he also smoked uh, a lot of packs of cigarettes. Yeah. He was a smoker. It's tough to quit. That's like a really hard thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's kind of a thing he kind of said like that the, he felt the cancer in his throat was due to like chewing on metal guitar picks. Like he, cause he'd always put in his mouth, he had this metal, I never knew you had a metal guitar pick, right? But uh, that's what that's what I read somewhere. But I feel like maybe, I don't know, like maybe it was also like a rationalization cause he's like, you know, it's really hard to quit smoking. So he's like, well, right. you know, I'm gonna not blame the cigarettes cause it's hard to give up cigarettes, you know? Right. Yeah, even even when I smoked, I would don't think I would do that. I think I'd be like, yeah, these things are gonna kill me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So don't smoke, kids. Yeah, actually, Kirk gave up smoking. That's really good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, and um, I have almost no desire to go back to it. Um, uh, th there's really nothing that you get from it aside from addiction. Yeah. Like if you want to be addicted to something, that's uh. You know that's the king of them yeah i've heard a couple things though like there's some argument that like you know that the that the uh, smoking is like habitual so it's more like the habit is the stronger draw but then other people like and I, but it's also like very much documented that there's like a physical addiction you know, but so I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. I've never, was never really a smoker. Like I probably smoked a couple cigarettes, like a handful of cigarettes in my 55 years and that's it. But um, yeah, I don't know. Good thing you're not smoking. My parent, my mom smoked for years and, um, and then she tried to quit a few times. And so she quit and then she'd get back on it and then she'd quit and she'd get back on it. It was really hard for her. It's really stressful for you, for your body and, you know, your mind to, to quit and go back yeah. to it yeah you know okay well let's let's wrap it up on on that note <laughs> all right <laughs> don't smoke note yeah don't smoke and uh if you if you liked this video um click the like button and um and consider subscribing and um uh, and if you subscribe hit that bell notification so <laughs> that you'll be sure to get notifications of each one of these episodes yeah. as it comes out I don't yeah. think I've ever said that before. Hit the bell, um, but um, but yeah, hit the bell. Don't smoke. Stay in school. Um, and, um, <laughs> practice. Practice your guitar. Practice guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Build something new every week. Yeah, and and leave your comments in the comment section. Yeah, and if you want to build a Vulcan, if you got any questions, the comment section will help you out. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's call it a wrap. All right. Thanks, everybody.